We Foster Film is made possible by funding provided by the Dugas Family Foundation, supporting visual arts education in Tennessee, Florida, and Texas, and viewers like you. Thank you. Greetings and welcome to episode two of We Foster Film, a show where we discuss all facets of filmmaking and television production with the people that make them. I'm your host, Cameron McCaslin, and joining me again today is my co-host, Nashville recording artist and star of television series, Cooking with Big Fella, NECAP board member and hardest working man in Nashville, Big Fella. How you doing tonight, Big Fella? Pretty good, man. Uh, fighting this cold in these corona times. Right on, man. Well, I hope you get to feeling better this evening as we get through this. I appreciate you being here to, to help push us through this. Um, on tonight's program, we're discussing living as an indie filmmaker in 2021. We put together a great set of panelists for tonight's discussion, all of which have been making films both feature length and short, uh, as well as web series, TV shows, and commercials. Uh, we think they each have a unique perspective on what it's like to be creating movies in these modern times. Uh, our first guest is filmmaker Amy Taylor, a graduate of both Princeton and Ohio University with an MFA in film production. She's directed uh, for the PBS Hulu series, Just Seen It, the, the web series, Jess Archer Versus, as well as the feature length film, Hunter's Weekend. In addition to her directing, she has worked as a freelance production coordinator and as an award-winning screenwriter with semifinalist placements at the Austin Screenplay Competition. Currently, she is developing The Big A, which was selected on the Blood List 9, a list of the best unproduced dark screenplays. Welcome, Amy. How are you tonight? Hi. Great. Thank you so much for having me. So our next guest is an award-winning filmmaker originally from right here in Nashville, Tennessee, Willie Robbins. Uh, he works as an actor, writer, and director with multiple short films, web series, and feature-length credits. Back in 2018, he won the Best Hometowner Narrative Short Film at uh, Indie Memphis for his short film, Minority. How are you doing tonight, Will? I'm pretty good, man. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. And finally, uh, we have Sophia Cassiola and Michael J. Epstein. They're independent genre filmmakers focusing on socio-political horror and sci-fi feature films. They began collaborating in the indie alternative music world, playing in many bands together and, and apply their scrappy DIY aesthetic to their film career. Their features include the pop social satire Clickbait, 70s Euro Vampire, uh, Blood, of the, Blood of the Tribids, Psychotronic Sci-Fi Magnetic, and the Avant Mystery 10. A selection of their work was shown uh, here during NECAT's film festival with Shiny Diamonds, which they produced winning Best Horror Short Film last year at the NECAT Film Festival. Welcome, Sophia and Michael. Hello, thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. So we're happy to have you all join us tonight uh, to talk about your work and careers. Um, I've learned over the last few years that taking time to talk to other filmmakers can help lead me down a new path, both in the way I view the world and how I create things. So I'm hoping with this conversation that we'll be able to do that for the people watching at home tonight. Um, you all came from a different backgrounds, but where I want to start tonight is more on the why of what you do. Uh, not so much how you got started, but why you chose film over every other medium. So what, is it, what does it give you? You know, film, what does it give you that keeps you coming back to it over and over again? Because you all have made multiple things. And we'll start with Amy on this one. Amy, why did you start making movies specifically? Huh, oh, well, <laughs> that's a big question. Um, I mean, I just always loved film and, you know, it combines all the other mediums. Um, <laughs> So, I, I mean, the closest you could get would be a theater, I guess. Um, and I found I just really loved working with the actors um, and them interpreting, you know, the stuff that I had written and making it so much better. And that's such a great collaboration um, that once I got a taste of it, <laughs> that was it. That's pretty cool, Amy. That, that is pretty cool. Uh, Michael Sophia. So y'all both started out doing music together, right? Exactly, yeah. So we started out in music videos for our own bands mostly. Uh, and then that kind of just naturally progressed into film. But I think we both love the visual medium with music and dialogue. But like, to me, it's like setting the stage and like making it per as perfect as I can with what I've got and filming it, so. We kind of always say that it was, uh, you, you can only lose so much money in uh, music. So we, we wanted to move over to film where there was a lot more opportunity to lose money. Um, no, but we, we just love telling stories and we love reaching people. And I think a lot of times people ask like, is it strange to go from music to film or, you know, writing or doing any, any other kind of medium? And the truth is, I think 
any way that you can connect with others, any way that you can tell a story that has some kind of emotional connection to others, I think that's that's what we're interested yeah. in. So whether it's, you know, whatever the format is, doesn't really matter. But we've always loved film. We, we grew up, you know, being obsessed with, I, I went to the, you know, video store every day and re rented tons of movies and watched, especially horror movies, watched every movie on the shelf. And you, you the were- The weirder, in, the better, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we love it all. What what made you switch though? Like, what was the actual thing that switched it from music to film? I mean, it's not like we gave up on on music particularly. Like, we still do music, and we do um, mostly all of our scores as well with another collaborator. So it's not like we like made like a full stop on music. We still do it, but um, yeah, I think it was just more of a challenge, and we we like to challenge ourselves and just where kind of led yeah I think you know the technology also changed a lot yeah. like so growing up we were both into film I, I used to shoot stuff on like VHS and edit together on two VCRs but I sort of looked at film as an intimidating format and expensive format and then uh the time that we were starting to make that transition which um you know early 2010 or so there was a lot of digital formats that became relatively inexpensive and we were able to buy a you know pretty inexpensive camera and start shooting music videos on our own and being able to create and tell stories on our own that were of a, a good enough quality that people would be interested in watching it. So that, I think the technology really drove that switch for us a lot. I know for me, like I, I came from uh, a history of music as well. And there was a point for me where it was just like, I got tired of being in broken down vans on the side of the road with guys who haven't showered in three or four days. And so it was an easy transition for me to make, but how about you, Will? What, what, what got you into this and what keeps bringing you back? Well, uh, firstly, for me, it was it was easy. It was I was I, I was I was chasing the dream of acting, uh, and in Nashville, it's not a whole lot of it. Was, at the time, it wasn't a whole lot of uh, film being shot in Nashville. So, uh, I I was doing a the theater thing for a while, and I didn't really want to keep going back and forth to Atlanta. Um, and this, I think, this was like right. I had an agent in Atlanta or whatever, and so I just was like, you know what, I give up. I, I'm gonna keep acting, but I'm gonna I'm gonna make my own films and I'm gonna star in them. I'm gonna you know do this and then cre also create opportunity for other people. So uh, I ended up doing that, man, and fell so much in love with it that my acting kind of took the back seat and I started taking writing a lot more serious. Probably taking directing serious first and then writing followed, and then I just kind of just fell in love with the whole process because storytelling for me is timeless like music is. So I have a background in music as well. And, and just, you know, it's timeless. It's like a time capsule on video. So working as any filmmakers, um, that's something you all have really dedicated some time to at this point. Um, you've all done multiple, you know, multiple look back at your, your careers. And I encourage everyone watching at home to, to look all these people up, just kind of look at the, the body of work they've already put together. But I know that, uh, you know, a lot of the times on independent films, you have to wear multiple hats. You know, it's not just as simple as showing up and you get to direct and then you get to come back home. You, there's a lot more that goes on with that. So how do you think that helps you with your movies? And, and I, I mean by like, it's, it's harder to do it by yourself sometimes, but it also helps you be involved in every aspect of it. So you kind of know what's going on and maybe even makes it more personal. At least, you know, that's been my experience. But Amy, we'll, we'll start with you on that one. I mean, like what, what do you think makes you better in doing it? Um, you know, I guess by yourself, you know, I'm not saying by yourself, but like, you're the, you're the one who's like, you're starting out with everything. Uh, well, I mean, the more experience you have in each of the, you know, different jobs, the more you can understand once you work with someone, you know, if you get a larger crew and actually have people to be in those jobs, you can understand what they need more from you as the director, because you'll have done the job. Um, and, you know, I think that just makes it, you know, innately uh, more efficient <laughs> and easier to communicate, you know, your needs to them um, and then understand what their, their needs are for you. So, um, you know, like I worked as a production coordinator, you know, freelance for a while and, you know, just the learning how to make a schedule, um, breaking down a script and, you know, all that sort of paperwork stuff. Um, you know, that helps you when you're coming up with a project, you can sort of make a rough estimate and say, okay, uh, am I writing a $100,000 script or am I writing a $10,000 script? Um, you know, I can break it down myself and figure that out uh, before I <laughs> commit to something that maybe I won't be able to fund or um, something like that. So 
you know, the more knowledge that you have, the better. Same question to you, Will. I mean, do you like doing a bunch of stuff on your film at once or do you wish you could just focus on one thing? Uh, I do every, I do everything that I do on my films out of necessity, not because I really, ha I, I want to. Um, now, if I had the people and the budget to include other bodies, then I'll be, bring it on. Uh, <laughs> I work with a crew of a hundred people. Um, I love people, uh, but uh, I, there's a, uh, also a, a sense of, uh, I guess, fulfillment that I get when I do everything. Um, it's not, again, it's not that I like to, I just, I end up being good at it, you know? Uh, <laughs> and so, um, you know, I just, eh, if I can push it off on somebody, I definitely will, but I, I, I enjoy what I do when I have to do it, you know, so. So, Sophia, Michael, um, you guys are working in pretty close quarters at this point. Um, you know, even before COVID, it's like you're, you're together, you're, you're doing that. How does that kind of dictate that portion of it for you? Because like you're riding together, you're, you're different. I mean, I know you guys take on different roles and different productions that you do, but how does that being so close all the time, you know, dictate how these movies go in, in your career? Yeah, well, I think we, we learned early on that we couldn't really afford to hire a lot of people. So we both kind of specialized in uh, different aspects. Like Michael does a lot of the post and a lot of the sound and I do the cinematography. And I also do like all the production design and set deck, like all that stuff too. But like, like Will was saying, I end up loving that because it gives me ultimate control over what the shots and the framing are and like what is in it. Uh, so like, I'm definitely like a control freak like that, though it would be awesome to be able to afford people. But I find like having a crew of like seven to 10 people, or sometimes it's just us, but like the ideal for me is like seven to 10 people. I can pull off crews that I've been on that have been like 50 people. I can pull off the same thing with the right experts and what they're doing. And that always feels like the best, like most maneuverable situation for me. Um, yeah, we're, I mean, we're often making films. I, I think yeah. everybody here, we're, we're talking about kind of DIY and, and often lower budget kind of stuff in, in many cases. So uh, you, you have to be very adaptable and very versatile. And, you know, the way, the way we always saw it is we don't want to be reliant. I've been on sets where like the sound person is, doesn't show up or is sick or w whatever. And then the whole shoot is, is canceled or uh, in big trouble. So I want to be able to plug into any spot that I need to plug into on basically any set that I, that I show up on um, and just make sure that we can keep things moving. And I think a Amy made a great point where it's really, as a director or producer, if you understand what everybody's job is and you understand what the challenges are in a particular situation, you're gonna be a lot better at managing that crew than if you're somebody who's like, I don't know, get, make the camera work. Why, what, why can't you record sound in this you know, noisy background situation? Like what, if they don't understand, you know, if somebody's trying to run, run the set and doesn't understand what the challenges are, they're not gonna make the best decisions probably. Can I chime in on that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That, I, 1000% I agree, Michael. Um, that's what I will say doing every job and knowing how to do every job just prepares you for bigger productions and bigger, you know, deals. If you end up directing for a studio, they'll love you and the crew will love you because you understand what sound needs. Uh, I'm doing sound on a project now and I'm like, ah, this is not, I know this is going to be crazy for the people in post. I'm, I'm looking out for everybody. I, if you're not slating right, it's going to be, it's going to be hectic for the editor. Um, if you don't, if, you know, it, it's a lot of things that go into uh, uh, making it all work. And by knowing every job, just, it just makes it easier. You know how to fix it. And, and we all know there's that, that stupid saying, fix it in post. No, fix it in production, <laughs> you know? Yeah. But yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would just <laughs> chime in. I think even if you don't have a chance to learn every job on set, um, if you can get editing experience, I think that's so valuable for a director because then, you know, you'll be able to just look at something and say, oh, this is not going to work in the edit. My editor is going to kill me if I give them this. Um, so I would say at least get editing experience if you can, um, if nothing else. <laughs> Amy, I, I know you, you talked about this a little bit already, but you've worked as a writer and director, but you've also done some, you know, jobs as a production coordinator. Can you talk about that a little bit? Like really more of like, how does that play out for you when you're not really, you're not at the helm of the production, but you're helping someone else get their vision across. Like what's the, what's the change in your mind on how you, how you 
differentiate between the two? Um, well, I mean, as a production quarter, it's very much a job. And your job is to get the logistics, you know, set and get the director everything that they need for their vision. And sometimes tell them this is not possible to get. Um, can we find a different solution? Um, and to, you know, I'm not emotionally invested in those projects in the same way um, as something that I'm writing and directing. Um, so it's, but, but it's a very, I don't know, it's like two different parts of your brain. It's sort of like organizational color-coded spreadsheet part and then, you know, creative, like let's work with the actors and see what happens part. Um, and so when I'm doing the directing part, I try not to limit myself too much with my production coordinator side. Um, and hopefully I have someone there to tell me, hey, we got to move on. Um, so, so yeah, that's, <laughs> I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> no, that that makes sense. I, I mean, I think just the idea of it being two different, you know, it, it's not that you're not working just as hard. It's just, like you say, you're not as creatively invested in the sense of, yeah, you don't have to carry so much in your brain at once, I guess. You just focus on the one thing, so. Yeah, yeah. for sure. It's yeah, like, I got to get these toilets to the right place <laughs> for the crew. Um, yeah. What, what about you, Will? Like, how, how do you choose what roles that you take on when you're doing a movie, being an actor who directs and writes, and like, what's the difference between when you're doing your acting for your own movie versus when you're doing your acting for somebody else's movie? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, for one, I, ju I just started, so this is actually, this, what I just shot in October is probably the best example of it. Uh, was learning how to let go. And uh, I met somebody, I met a guy uh, at an acting class out here and he's a director. He's, he's kind of new, but he's really good. And uh, he's won a lot of awards for his first two films. And, and I wasn't really hung up on that. It's like, okay, plenty of people <laughs> can win awards for films that are, you know, I'm not gonna call anybody's art garbage, but come on, let's, let's just be real. Uh, people win awards for many reasons, uh, but I trusted him and he's a great actor himself. And so I trusted him and I said, you know what? I'm gonna let somebody else direct and I'm gonna get a DP. And uh, that's what I did and I acted and I produced and I edited the project and I just, you know, and I, 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 um, I hired somebody to do sound. And uh, that was the first time I really, actually the second time I really produced and didn't have too much say so in the end, but I told them, as a producer, this is what I'm looking for. Okay, can you deliver on this level? At, but the rest is your vi it's your vision because I understand as a director you have a vision. I, I wrote the script, but you do what do your thing. And so he did that, and that that was like a a breath of fresh air to be able to really focus on acting. So with myself, with something that I write and direct. I don't think I would do myself justice as an actor to try to direct, you know, and, and some people do it. You can do it when you get to a certain level. There's, there's, when you have more time, but usually in when we do things, how we do things, Michael, Sophia, we, you, you know, you got to get in and get out sometimes and you don't have time to really just sit there like Hollywood productions out here. They waste a bunch of time on five, three pages is a whole 12 hour shoot. How? I have no idea. Uh, but um, sometimes, you know, you, you just have to do what you have to do and you have to be realistic with what's on the page. You know, if we're doing, I, I often write when I'm doing a short, I know I don't do anything over a certain amount of, a uh, certain amount of pages that if, if I know I can do it in a day, I, I know a lot of things. I try to calculate if I need to DP or not. Right. So if it's, if it's going to be over more than one day, I'm not going to pay $300 a day for it director photography no i'll shoot it <laughs> i'll direct it it's easier to shoot and direct than it is to like shoot direct and act so i just push it off when i need to that's real that's real so i know that all of y'all have have made like a few different things at this point right so let me ask you this question what do you think the biggest difference between making a short project and a feature length project is because you know, it's different trying to get people together for something that's like 80 to 90 minutes versus 
something that's five to 10 minutes. And what is it like for you to make the transition from one to, to the other one? Amy, start with you. Um, I mean, probably stamina is <laughs> the biggest thing I can think of. Um, just, you know, a short, you know, it's a weekend. It's, you know, your friends, you can get them together, shoot it real quick, boom, done. Uh, feature, you know, everything is just so much longer. And it's like, can I get people invested in this process with me enough um, that even if the money is not great, you know, they're going to want to invest their time. Um, and, you know, it's not going to be like, oh, I've committed to this thing, but I don't really, you know, they're not paying me anything. It's like, yeah, I'm committed to this thing. And, you know, I believe in this project and I want to, you know, see it through to the end. Um, and yeah, getting, getting that kind of commitment, um, to what could be, I mean, of course, at this budget, the feature shoots are not even <laughs> that long. <laughs> um, so it's, but it's still, you know, such a greater commitment of time, especially if you want to do, um, you know, I try and do a lot of pre-production with everyone so that when we get to the set, it's just like, boom, boom, boom. Um, so there's that investment. Uh, yeah, that's, I think that's the biggest change for me. Same question for, for you, Mike and Sophia. What's the difference between a short and a feature and that transition between? That's hard. I mean, I think a lot of people think like a feature is just like doing a couple of shorts in a row and it's really not. It's so much like bigger part of like planning in your brain than just that. Um, and we do a lot of shorts that are like two, three days, but then our features are like 10, 12 days, but it's still like, they're so much worse. You know? yeah. Um, but yeah, it's the same thing as Amy said, just getting people on for the ride, because like, I try to get the best people I can and pay them so little, but like, they're my friends. So they take it. Um, I just think getting everybody together. You can to also for a weekend, you can all tough it and work longer hours and do things that are like a little more uncomfortable, but like by day, t you know, when we shot our first, uh, feature. It was 10 days straight. We were all staying at the location. And we personally were working about 20 hours a day. Which and wasn't I, by design. It just ended up uh, being what had to happen. <laughs> and uh, I will tell you, after like, you know, seven, eight, nine, 10 days of working 20 hours a day, yeah. you start just hallucinating. You're not even awake yeah. when you're awake. Yeah. You're just Luckily, hallucinating we didn't have to drive anywhere. Yeah. Um, so it's, you know, it's a physical, there are physical limitations to it when we're doing it at the scale that we're doing it at. Uh, there are limitations in terms of what people's, People are happy to come for a day and, and work 12 hours, but like if they're gonna work 10 days in a row for 12 hours, they have to be you know interested and committed, like Amy said. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know for me, like one of the the big things I've done is like I'll shoot shorts really as auditions for other things, just to see if I want to hang out with these people for weeks at a time. Um, because you know, I, I'm sure we all could share a nightmare story about someone we thought was great and then they showed up and it wasn't as great as you wanted it to be, um, whether personality wise or just uh, skill level. Um, but um, I, I kind of have the point where I would do more short films than actually like hold auditions for my movies. So like it takes the same amount of time. And like, if I make a bad short film, not a big deal. I can just throw it out and keep moving, you know? Um, but, you know, that said, I want to jump to Will, you know, on this, on the same thing, like, um, you know, I know you've kind of done, uh, you've done some web series stuff, you've done some, you know, some lengthy stuff and you've done some short films. Like what's the difference, you know, for you between the long and the short? And you talked about a little bit, like, you know, not hiring someone to be a DP for multiple days, but like what other part of that, like, um, I guess like mentally do you prepare for whatever you're doing something real short or something, you know, it's going to take a while. Uh, man, really. Uh, I think, I think, uh, well, everybody's covered it, Amy and Sophia and Michael really said it, uh, but for me, um, it's the script, making sure the script is tight, making sure it's where I need it. Um, my first feature film, uh, like it was yesterday, I was so passionate about getting my first feature done. I've got like over 12 short films and one of the things that, that plays into that, I'll jump in right there, uh, footnote is, the transitions between shorts is always what do I do with it? Like what do like where do I take it when I'm done? I put blood, sweat, and tears for like a day, two days, 
regardless of who was on it, who shot, who did what, it's like, what, where does it go? You know, am I submitting to festivals? Cause I, I didn't kind of, to be honest, I kind of lost faith in festivals. It's more so about finding ways to get it in front of your audience, skip the middleman and just jump straight in front of the people that support you. And so uh, I think that's what I spend a lot of time on in, uh, when it comes to uh, finishing a project, going to the next one. So once the next one, once one is out, it's like, okay, what do I want to do next? You know, um, and then I just I sift through my ideas and I'm like, hey, this this looks good. This would be easy. I think this is pretty cool. So I'll go to that. And if I usually sometimes I work with the same actors because they're good. You know, who cares? Tarantino does it. Spike does it. Everybody does it. So uh, Martin Scorsese, Leo, Leonardo DiCaprio, you know, everybody has their their uh, faithful bunch that they work with. And so that's one of the ways that I get going quicker too, is that I, I don't, I never cast. I never take time to audition. I just pick people that I've seen work, that I've worked with in, in shows and stuff like that. And I keep it moving. But when it came to my feature, uh, I kept writing and pitching and pitching and pitching. I pitched at a film festival in Nashville uh, and I got a tip because I, that script, in its original state was all over the place. And so I had to think like a producer. I really had to think like a producer in order to do it. And I kept pitching and I was like, you know what? Nobody's interested, screw it, I'll do it. So the one tip that the lady gave me, she said one day, she told me to go back and watch Fruitvale Station and Fruitvale Station and uh, there's, there's a like training day. These are different films that take place in a day. And so that opened up my, I like it bust my head wide open. I had 90 pages of location after location after location. And so I went back when she said one day, I said, hmm, I took it, broke down my original script that was all over the place as far as locations. And this, I made the story take place in a day. This cut down on wardrobe. This cut down on a lot of things. Let's just cut down on locations because it was like a walk and talk around downtown Nashville. Uh, an old couple that used to be together, you know, and it was just really easy. And then I went and used my resources as far as locations, people that I knew, some of the actors, homes, um, I, I paid them. I didn't really have a crew to pay, I paid audio and it was just me. And so that whole transition, like we shot that over the course of supposed to be a month, but it ended up being like six months. Uh, and, you know, and we, we got it done, but it was, it was not a doozy like Michael and Sophia, they, they, you guys are great. Like you 10, 15 days. I, I wish I could do it. I think we did 10, 15 days over the course of like six months, but, but, uh, overall, um, that's what it was. I hope I answered your question, but yeah, that's transitioning like short after short after short. So, and sometimes, like you said, uh, Cameron, uh, auditioning, uh, 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 when you're doing a production is kind of playing like an audition. Sometimes now, for me, my shorts are shorter versions of a potential feature. So if I go back, sometimes the shorts help me write a feature. It's just like, okay, I like that idea. How could you stretch it to make it, you know, into a full length feature? So, yeah. Uh, you know, we, we talked about this a little bit already, um, but I, I know for me, you know, it's like whatever I've, I've worked as a producer, director, and a writer, you know, kind of same as all you guys. But it's one of those things where, like, when I'm directing, I approach it a little bit differently than um, I feel like my job, I guess, is to, like, convey to the crew what it is that I want. You know, it's like you, you hire the best people, you get talented people in those positions, and you trust them to do their job. But it's like you, your whole goal is, like, how do you get it out on um, in a way that they're going to understand it and they're going to, um, you know, I guess, be able to, to get that information and, and use it. I don't know, like, when I'm a producer, it's totally different because... I'm, I'm constantly trying to, um, I guess, get that same thing for the other person and be the, be the version that, you know, people would want. Um, so I want to jump right back to Will on that. Like, I know you kind of worked as an actor and as a producer and a director, but like, how, what is that dynamic, you know, like where you, where you can just kind of give it away and, and get back in to let someone else do it? Can you elaborate a little bit on that question? <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'm just saying like, whenever, um, when it comes to like, um, just letting go of like, say you're a director and it's your thing, but if you show up on someone else's set and you're, you're just a producer, you're just an actor, you know, and I, I say just in the sense of like, that's not a huge job anyways, but like in the sense of like, how do you, how do you let go of that stuff whenever you see someone doing something that 
you wouldn't do it that way. It's not that maybe it's incorrect. It's just like, it's not the way you would approach it. How do you step back from that and just put your actor face on or put your producer face on and say, what is it that you want? How can I give it to you? As opposed to like, no, this, you're going to, you know, it's, it's not even so much that they're going to create a train wreck, but like, it's just, they're not doing it the same way you would do it. How do you let go of that? Man, that's such a good question. Uh, it's about trust, man. At the end of the day, it's about trust. Like you have to trust the people that, that you uh, got on the project, you know, because for me, um, when I stepped back, when I stepped back, I had to think of, I was thinking I was trying to protect my, my acting ability. Cause I didn't, cause oftentimes like I've done it before I've, I've acted and stuff that I directed and my brain is not where it should be as an actor. I'm always thinking about, okay, is that shot good enough? Like, am I like too far? I'm super technical in my head as an actor directing, um, then, then the other way around. So it's like, it's, it's, it's trust, man. It's, it's really trust. That's all I can really say. It's, it's, it's about the trust. Um, because when I let go, I have to trust you. I have to, cause I, everything that I've even on set and I'll say this because when I was on set, I had moments where I was like, okay, you guys are going to get the shot where you reverse. And it was like, yeah, we chill out. And I, and I, I, I knew them. So they were able to, we had fun on set, but I was like, okay, my bad. I'm sorry. I, I stepped back, but it did, it definitely did happen because when it wasn't on my coverage or I wasn't in the shot, I was just like hovering like a, like a micromanager. Like I was just like walking around the back of them, like looking over to like, I'm okay. Okay. That looks good. Maybe, mm, you know, but I would, I wouldn't say anything. Cause I was just like, okay, I hired these people. Let me let them do their thing, you know? And um, it turned out, it turned out dope. It was, it was a really good, it was a really good film and I'm, and I'm happy with it. So, yeah. That's real. That's real. Uh, Sophia and Michael. So what does that process look like for y'all getting the thing mapped out, you know? Well, I think like what Amy and, and Will were saying about, you're always auditioning your cast and crew on every set you're on. Cause I work a lot in camera department as a focus puller or cam op. And like, I'm watching all the crew and being like, who am I gonna hire later for my own stuff? And it's gotta be people that are fun and people that stay professional past eight, hour eight, past hour 10, you know, like I still want like some level of professionalism, but also like jokes, you know? <laughs> so, you know, it's finding those people. And like you're saying, I'm always going to go back to like, if I have a role and I know somebody that's going to be good for it and I've worked with them before and I can trust them, I'm going to go to that person hundred percent of the time rather than go on an unknown element. Um, yeah. Kind of building on that. I, I did sound a lot on productions and I always said, uh, being, being, doing sound is like being a spy on a set because nobody thinks you're actually gonna, you're, nobody, like actors don't think you're important or gonna hire them for a project later, right? So if the actors, you can tell by how the actor treats you as the sound person, you know, whether it's somebody that you want to be working with in a different capacity, things like that. But, um, you know, spinning it to the other question in terms of being in a role on a set where you don't have control uh, I, the way I always view it, I'm bad, <laughs> I'm bad. And the way I always view it is if I see like a technical error, like if it's an aesthetic choice, that's an aesthetic choice, you know, whatever filmmakers want to do, they'd want to do. If I see a technical error, like if I'm doing sound and I see a technical camera error or something, I will say it once. And if the person wants to deal with it, they will deal with it. And if they blow it off, then they, then that's fine. It's not my, not my role at that point, but I will bring it up in case. And many times I've noticed things that that are technical errors that people appreciate hearing about because it you know it does save a problem later. No, nah, that's yeah, yeah, that's really real right there. You Amy, really? oh, okay, now nah, Will, go ahead, go ahead. No, go, go ahead, Amy. No, nah, no, nah, I want to hear what you had to say, man. You were inspired. <laughs> well, man. I, I, go I was just gonna say what that well, um, like what what Michael was saying, like exactly that. Um, me doing sound on a on a on a production now. Uh, sometimes you you'll see as a because I, I DP I do everything so it's you can when you see somebody break like one of the biggest things that is hard for me not to say anything and I'll sit back and the, based on how they react to my suggestion or me calling out a red flag is going to determine if I say anything else 
the rest, all right, you can you can just continue to fail if you don't understand what I'm saying. And that's basically breaking the 180 rule. So if you have a shot here, a shot here, and then you jump sides and you you mess up the geography of of a scene, it's like okay, okay, you you, you wouldn't be able to do that. I don't I don't think you would. Yeah, like if you yeah you can't. Oh, okay, okay, okay. And then they do it anyway. Oh, all right, all right. Do you think I, I'm out of place? You know, I'm gonna stick to my. I'm just a sound guy. I'm just a sound guy. So, so I, I totally, I totally understand what Michael is saying. Amy, what's your take on a uh, situation? <laughs> no, I agree. I think that's 100. Um, percent What they were saying is, if you notice something, if you see something, say something. Say it once, but you know, if then it's it's not up to you anymore because you don't want to be that person who is always like, well geez this guy doesn't you know you you say it once and then it's up to them um and <laughs> i used to do a lot of uh in film school i was always like the script supervisor <laughs> so that's a lot of pointing out continuity which you know may or may not be important um so it's like yeah you point it out once if they don't you know if that's not important you move on um and you can't get hung up on stuff like that even though <laughs> it could be hard. <laughs> you know, I know the one thing that ties all four of you together is, is that you're all working on, you know, smaller, smaller budgets a lot of the time. And, you know, I have found um, that, the, you know, sometimes the constraints of that can make, I don't know, make creative things happen. Um, obviously, we all would like to have more money, you know, and, and time uh, more than anything for our movies. But what do you think, you know, that I guess making low budget films what has it done to make you a better filmmaker? How, you know, how has that turned you into being able to, to move differently or faster or think, you know, on your feet? Um, and Will, we'll start with you again on that. I was gonna say, I was gonna hit the buzzer. Like, like there was a buzzer, I wanted to answer it. Uh, uh, man, I, like one of my philosophy, this is, this is my philosophy and this goes for any industry, any dream that anybody has, don't let anybody tell you no. Like, I, like, don't let nobody tell you no. I'm not gonna let, cause I don't have the, the uh, not having money be the reason I don't make this project, you know? Um, I just, I go for it, I go for it. That's my motto. And every time I, I sometimes I get beside myself cause I'm out here in LA now and uh, it trips me out. Uh, Michael, Sophia, I don't know if you, you guys have been out here or worked out here, uh, but I'm, baffled at the fact that most of the people out here only know how to do one thing. They, 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 I mean, they cannot multitask. Uh, it's like, they always need somebody to do sound. They always need somebody to shoot. And they're also getting hung up on the, 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 the dumbest stuff possible, which for me, that is camera. Uh, people get hung up on, I got to shoot on a red. I got to shoot on an Ari. I got to shoot on a, you got to shoot on the biggest format camera possible, but don't think about post-production. You don't have the, the CPU, the GPU to handle Ari Alexa footage, <laughs> you know? So it's, it's, it's a lot of those little things that, that, um, that I am just blown away by just in, in the land of film, just it's, it's wild, you know? So I just never let any of that stuff, um, determine what I'm gonna do, my, you know, me moving or making a project. Nah, that's super real. I feel that all the way. Uh, Amy, what about you? Do you think making movies on the cheap has made you better at what you do? I mean, it's definitely made me more flexible <laughs> in what I'm able to do. Um, and I think just, yeah, just the problem solving you have to do. Um, you know, inevitably makes you better sort of trying to think outside the box and all this stuff. Um, and I do find um, like the feature I did, I wrote it with specific assets in mind. I was like, okay, I have this, you know, place I can shoot. I have these actors, what can I do with that? Um, and, and so I wrote it specifically, you know, for those actors and for that location. Um, and it was a mockumentary, so we shot on a Sony EX3, um, you know. So it was like, yeah, we, we, we wrote to the assets we had 
um, and we shot with the assets we knew we could get. Um, so yeah, so I, I think at this level of budget, it just makes you more flexible um, and, and that can only help. Yeah, and so um, we'll, you know, uh, Sophia and Michael are actually out in Los Angeles as well. So you guys probably ought to get together at some point. Uh, wow. And, and talk shop. So yeah, yeah, y'all are probably closer than you know at this point. Um, I, I want to do want to jump back to Sophia and Michael on this one and, and get their take on it because I know you guys have made a lot of stuff on minimal budgets. Um, you know, jumping from shorts to features, like I say, not only uh, writing and producing your own stuff, and you know, Sophia, I know you shoot a lot of stuff for other people, but like you're you're turning out a lot of um, I hate to call it product because I, I don't like when people use that, that kind of phrase, but like before the pandemic and you guys were up and running, like I would bump into you at film festivals and like you guys would always have like three new movies that were either like um i think whatever even when we did the kneecap film festival you're like yeah we had three or four things we could send in like all at once and so like you've got a, a fresh slate going all the time talk to me a little bit about like that that low budget diy aspect of like what's made you better where like you could make stuff for yourself but you could also go work for someone else and like and, and put it all together yeah i mean i think a lot of it is like going on the big sets and seeing how compartmentalized they are <laughs> and then like being like, well, that's mainly the difference between like some of our stuff and like the bigger stuff, like the budget goes to people and compartmentalizing the jobs. So like if you're paying all those people, that's where the budget went. And if you're not doing that, then it's all going on screen. And so our projects, all the money goes on screen for better or worse. Um, but it's exactly what Amy said. It's writing to what you know you have or what you can get for cheap, uh, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I think we, we also, I mean, some of the projects, Cameron, that you were talking about, we do a lot of different things. Like, so we produce for a lot of people, we get hired. Somebody says, oh, I have a short film, I wanna direct it. I don't really know how to like put together a team, you know, to, to do that. So we, you know, we are able to plug in and do different kinds of things and take different approaches to projects. And I think all of that comes out of making things for no money. So somebody can say, this is my budget. And we can say, okay, this is the way that we can make the script that you have work with that budget. Um, and everything scales, I mean, you can, I, we can literally make any movie for no money or for millions of dollars. I mean, it's just, you know, the, the, there'll be differences in yeah. the quality and other aspects of it. But, but you know, you can, you can handle something, we can make it work at many, many different scales. And I think that skill really comes from that, that sort of DIY and like yeah. learning every job and figuring out, you know, what is necessary and what is adaptable. In general too, like we have like a 90% rule. Like I like, will often get stuck in trying to be like super perfectionist, but like if it's 90% there, like it's good. <laughs> Release it, you're good. <laughs> like you can you can drive yourself mad perfecting the last 10%. And that goes for being on set to post like all the way. Yeah, because you'll spend twice as much money to get that last 10% and you'll spend twice as much time to get that last 10%. So it's, you know, it's you finding the entire other thing. Yeah, yeah, it's finding the time to say to say good enough and then, you know, moving on, I think is a big part of keeping budgets down. And yeah. You know, I, I think it is saying it's scalable. I mean, like we, me and Big Fellow were working on something even earlier today where we were talking about that, like just about putting the money on paper and then like figuring out like, well, if we could get this, we could do this. But if we had more, we could do better. Um, so, you know, that, I don't know. It's really cool to kind of hear that for all the things that are different about how we all make our stuff separately, it's like, there's a lot of stuff that's just universal truths um, that I think a lot of people that are watching at home can, can apply to that. But all that said, uh, we're getting pretty close to the end here. Um, I, and I wanted to make sure that we didn't leave it without allowing all of you to give a little bit of advice to those other filmmakers that are listening at home. And uh, with all that you know and the time spent making all these projects that, that everybody's been on your experience in school and just, you know, life in general, what do you wish that you knew when you were starting? Uh, and what advice would you give to someone who might be making the first project or, or maybe even just like jumping from that, that short film, uh, you know, like getting those short films knocked out into making a feature film for the first time like uh, and anyone really can start on this one if, if someone wants to jump in and we'll just we'll go around the horn on it yeah i think it, uh first thing is like to figure out like what are you saying <laughs> like what is the point of your project why do you have to make it like what do you like and what do you want to bring into it and then you know like go back and watch stuff that inspires you and see why it works and like, like, well, the same with Fruitville Station, like see why those edits work, see why it works that it's in a day um, and see why you like it and like what you have to say to the world. And then just get on set and get some friends that wanna help you 
and figure it out from there because that's the only way you're really going to do it is if you like we were saying before if you really learn all the jobs or as many as you can become an editor editing like will make you a better cinematographer it'll make you a better actor it'll make you a better director so like definitely just do a short and edit it yourself and you'll learn everything you did wrong <laughs> and i think do your best to be a decent person because yeah, then, thank you. Because <laughs> then you'll get people, we always, jo we, we talk about it as like our crew needs to believe in the dream. Like every movie is a dream and every person you bring to set needs to believe in that dream in order for it to work because we're not getting paid enough to like make it, you know, like that, that's not the motivation. It has to be beyond just the compensation for it. And sure, you know, that's nice and the glory of it is nice, but like everybody's got to really believe that the project is worthwhile. They've got to believe that they want to support you as the as the creator. If you're the director, you're the writer. They want to they want to see your vision and say like this is something I want to get behind and be part of. You want you got to have everybody kind of onboarded. And so that's what being a good kind of leader is a lot about. It's about selling that dream. Right on. Amy, we'll jump to you on this. What piece of advice would you give or what do you wish you knew when you started? Well, I mean, I think that Sophia and Michael gave <laughs> really great advice. Um, I mean, yeah, get on sets and get as much experience as you can. Um, and and I don't know, watch as many movies as you can and figure out why they work. Um, learning how to edit actually, I think is a really great skill to have um, because then you can really learn how it works. You can take things apart and put them back together and that'll help you with your writing as well as directing um and then yeah and then get out there and figure out what you're passionate about i think that's great advice <laughs> i can't right top on. that <laughs> i love it um finally uh willie jump in uh everything they said no uh really uh really no everything they said and just you know plan better you shoot better plan better shoot better and then the last thing be consistent um, be consistent in character, integrity. When you, when you say you're going to show up, show up. Um, when you, you know, you say you're going to make something, make it. Be true to yourself. Um, uh, find your voice. Find your voice. Your voice is, is, it may be buried somewhere deep down within. Just pull it out. It'll come out the more you, the more you're consistent. So. Man, that was like great advice. That was the, the most greatest collective uh, words of wisdom right there for anybody that's making stuff. I appreciate y'all so much. Cam, I love this whole thing, man. It's been pretty, pretty damn cool. I, I, I agree, man. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're just about out of time and I do want to go around real quick. Where can people find uh, you and your stuff if they want to look for you on the internet, whether that be your website, Twitter, Facebook, whatever. Uh, Michael, Sophia, let's, let's start with you. Yeah, we're both on all the social media just as our full names. So Sophie Cassula and yeah, Michael J. Epstein and our production company is called Launchover. So just launchover.com. You can go from there and find it all. Will, how about you? Uh, I'm on Instagram as the Willie Robbins. Um, don't know why I put the like I'm somebody, but uh, <laughs> it's the Willie Robbins. And uh, my website is strongwillmedia.com. And Amy? Yeah, um, I'm on Twitter and Instagram um, at Walking Candy Apple. Uh, that's a Seinfeld reference. I don't know. I got on there in 2009, whatever. <laughs> um, and then my website is amytaylordirector.com. Right on. So that's about all the time we have uh, tonight for uh, We Foster Film. I appreciate the insight from all of you. Uh, once again, I want to thank my co-host, Big Fella, as well as all four of our panelists for joining us and offering their expertise and sharing their stories. I also want to thank the Dugas Family Foundation for helping to make this program possible. We Foster Film is named in loving memory of Foster Dugas, who loved movies, monster makeup, Halloween, and all things creative. We are constantly thankful for his impact that uh, he's had here at NECAT and for his ongoing le legacy of creative and technical education programming. Uh, to learn more about We Foster Film and NECAT, please visit us on the web at necatnetwork.org. Uh, we want to thank you all at home for watching and hope you'll join us again next time for We Foster Film. Good night. Thank you for watching We Foster Film, named in loving memory of Foster Dugas, who loved movies, monster makeup, Halloween, and all things creative. We Foster Film is made possible by funding provided by the Dugas Family Foundation. 
supporting visual arts education in Tennessee, Florida, and Texas, and viewers like you. Thank you. To find out how you can support locally made television or to start your own film and television career, visit us on the web at kneecatnetwork.org.